I already, I think, welcomed some of you who were here uh, from the start. So let me just say a big welcome to everyone uh, who's here to the summit, to today, and to Dr. Maria's talk. Uh, I'd like to just share a little bit about Dr. Maria Church's background. And um, she knows what it is to lead a team. After she received her Doctor of Management degree in organizational leadership, she went on to take a senior position at a Fortune 500 company. And then for the next 25 years, she was working for Fortune 500 companies, for local governments, for nonprofits, and academia. So she's quite intimately familiar with all the ups and downs of holding a senior position in both public, corporate, and academic worlds. Uh, today, as uh, the CEO of Dr. Maria Church International, um, which has a government and a corporate leadership division, as well as the Leadership Development University, Dr. Church brings that depth of knowledge and her unique qualification, which is basically specializing in organizational culture, leadership development, and change agility with a focus on love to the aid of companies, teams, and individuals. Uh, she has also started a long needed movement to revolutionize the workplace by transforming leadership at all levels through a seismic shift from fear to love. And the journey from fear to love or the journey from the head to the heart is a long 18 inch journey as she likes to put it. Her organizational culture work has helped her clients to reshape their cultures so that they pursue clear strategic objectives, they adopt progressive, authentic approaches, and become differentiators at their marketplace. And the cherry on the top is that the work has realized her clients over 300% ROI. Um, besides the actual active work and consulting, Dr. Church has authored three books including two best-selling ones, which are called Love-Based Leadership, The Model for Leading with Strength, Grace, and Authenticity. And a second book, A Course in Leadership, 21 Spiritual Lessons on Power, Love, and Influence. And she's currently working on her fourth book. Now, besides all this, where she has the time, I don't know, but I'd be very interested to know. She has also taken an insight and message to an impressive range of mediums. Uh, to name a few, um, she hosts an online leadership series called Maria, Dr. Maria TV. She has been featured in magazines and newspaper articles, on radio shows, in television interviews, on ABC, Fox, etc. And she has also been teaching for several universities for the past 20 years, winning numerous faculty awards. She is, and the last thing I'm going to say before I hand it over to her to take us through this session, she is part of a very select 17% worldwide that has earned a CSP, and CSP stands for Certified Speaking Professional. There is such a degree which is very, very select, and it's a designation from the National Speakers Association. So Dr. Church, with that, I welcome you and uh, ask you to take over. Uh, we will handle questions right at the end of the session. So there will be 15 minutes kept for it. Um, please raise your hand, put a hand up so I can see it, or put it in the chat at the end of the talk so I can look up the questions there. So Dr. Maria. Thank you so much. All right, I wanna share my screen with you and make sure that you are seeing these slides. If someone can give me a thumbs up, that would be very much appreciated. It's good. All right. Yeah, we can see. Okay, fantastic. Again, thank you so much for inviting me to speak with you group with your group. You all do incredible work, and and frankly, I'm just honored to do, to be in your presence and to share the idea of leading with love. I wholeheartedly believe that leading with love is absolutely the heart of success. So I want to ask you um, if you could again just click the the um, thumbs up icon, would love to know how many of you are leaders. All right, so I'm seeing, I'm seeing several people do that. We are, and, and certainly have the capacity, have the responsibility, have the call to all be leaders. Um, some of us have positional leadership roles. 
uh, some of us um, are leading families, some of us are leading communities, um, some of us are certainly leading teams. At the very least, and certainly at the very greatest, we are leaders of our own lives. And that is the call to, to step into that leadership role in a really powerful and a profound way. As we know, right now, it seems like the world is fragmenting. And I believe that we are at a really important time and place to help regroup. Um, people might say we're in chaos. And as we know, chaos is really just an opportunity for matter to reorganize. And we are reorganizing in a really big and a really profound way. This perhaps is our wake up call. And our wake up call is a calling. And our wake up call is for leaders to really step in and question and lead and, and guide those around us to really, again, wake up from the complacency that we might have been feeling to wake up and say, you know, we've had enough of fear. Fear has been destroying our, our countries, our world, our life, when we allow ourselves to be inundated and surrounded by fear. It seems that every newspaper we open up today, every news channel, um, even social media, things like Facebook, and, and I've even seen this on LinkedIn, are fearful messages. And, and so I, I ask you to uh, hear the alarm, to hear the wake up call, and really for us to say enough is enough. Fear is destructive, fear is not uplifting, and fear really is powerful, but it is not as powerful as the most powerful force on the planet, of course, which is love. I love this quote from the Dalai Lama um, several years back at a peace summit in Canada when he very boldly and profoundly stated that the world will be saved by the Western woman. And what I really believe he uh, was meant when he said that is the energy that we perhaps see in the Western world of the female energy really rising up. And in your part of the world, I know that you see this energy too, and that many of you, especially those of you that are called to do the work that you're doing, um, have this energy of rising up, of independence, of really saying enough is enough. And not only that, but let me show you a better way. Let me show you a much more effective and a much more profound way to lead. I truly believe that we are at a crossroads, that we could continue on the path of fear, of divisiveness, of division of hatred, of the violence, the worldwide violence that we are all are seeing and experiencing, we could certainly continue on that path. Or we could continue on the path of light, on the path of love, on the path of joy, on the path of the most powerful force on this planet, which of course is love. Now, <laughs> When I speak on love, of course, we all have different mental models, different mindsets, different frames and references what the word means. Some people have told me it's even confusing. So let me be very clear. I am not talking about puppies, kittens, and rainbows. What I am talking about is a leveraging of love in the universal concept, in the universal construct in the universal definition, which is really to love, to honor, and to respect one another. This is the leadership model that I developed several years ago called Love-Based Leadership, and it's really based on three primary pillars. 
love of self, love of source, and love of others. So let me first begin with love of self. As was so beautifully stated uh, in my introduction, uh, I, I really do believe the longest, most arduous journey perhaps that we could ever make is that 18 inches from our head to our heart. And yet there is so much joy and so much enlightenment and so much peace and so much insight when we do make that journey. Um, and we begin, as we always do with leadership development programs, really beginning with self. The first of seven pillars in love of self is to really trust our intuition. Now, some of you might have been raised to really trust your intuition. I was certainly privileged enough in my youth uh, that whenever I had a question or was at a crossroads or wasn't quite sure um, which direction to go, which decision to make, my mother would say to me, well, what does your intuition tell you? And I didn't realize that not everybody's mother said that to them. And for that, I will be forever grateful. However, in my adult life, and I'll never forget it, my first corporate position at a Fortune 500 company was a land developer and home builder. I remember going to my very first meeting. I was newly hired, um, had flown into the corporate headquarters, uh, had the power suit on, had my briefcase. And of course, I'm a recovering A-type personality. So I prepared and prepared and over-prepared. So I was ready for this meeting, albeit I was a little nervous and anxious. And I remember being in the meeting and the company president had turned to me and he said, Maria, what do you think? Well, I sat up straight in my chair and I thought, this is my moment. I have been preparing for this. And I brought, brought very proudly proclaimed, well, I feel that. And I literally had his hand in my face. And then he leaned in and he said, Maria, I don't care what you feel. Tell me what you know. And I realized in that moment, oh, we don't speak about intuition here. We don't talk about feelings here. And I learned the language that I was to use in the corporate environment. And in fact, in many corporate environments, I've learned the language. The language is called Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> so if you can put anything on an Excel spreadsheet, chances are you'll have a good opportunity to get that approved. Uh, so I did learn that about intuition. However, I am certainly not advocating that we throw logic out of the window. What I am advocating is that we use every tool that we have available to us and not limit ourselves to the tools that are so innate to us, such as intuition. Now, the second and the third pillar in love of self is really uh, all around truth. So, of course, it's truth telling. We always want to stand in integrity and we want to have the reputation for being truthful. Also, is equally as important is truth receiving. To know that we are receiving truth. We are both telling truth to others and to ourselves and that we are receiving truth from others as well. And so we have a responsibility to say when that truth that we are receiving doesn't quite feel truthful. Uh, and I remember hearing a wonderful, wonderful line by Ian Le Van Zandt, who you might've heard uh, present um, in her talks on, on uh, television, or um, I have many of her talks on uh, CDs, which of course dates me, uh, but of course on YouTube. Anyway, one of, the, one of the phrases that Iyanla said when people were not being truthful with her was beautiful. While that may feel truthful to you, it doesn't feel truthful to me. <laughs> I just love that line and have actually used that many times. But it's very important when we truly do love ourselves that we don't allow other people's non-truths to enter into the equation. Now the fourth uh, pillar or the fourth component of this pillar of love of self is probably the most 
important leadership aspect next to love uh, that I believe all leaders should have in their toolbox. And, and I do many, many leadership development courses and lectures and teachings. And I truly advocate the power of choice. And this to me is really the tool that we use both in our leadership as well as our lives that actually open up the world of possibilities to us when we recognize that we always have a choice. Now granted, some choices may be more desirable than other choices, but we always have a choice. Dr. Viktor Frankl, Man's Search for Meaning, which I'm sure many of you have read, um, Man's Search for Meaning. Of course, Dr. Frankl was a brilliant psychiatrist back in the Nazi Germany era. And like so many people, um, was captured by the Nazis and spent uh, time through a series of concentration camps. We know that Dr. Frankl was stripped of everything, his family, his friends, his life's work, his name, and was given a number. And he was stripped even of his clothing. And what Dr. Frankel has written and said about that experience was he realized that there was one thing that the Nazis could not take from him, ever. He could choose to give it away, but he wasn't about to do that. And that was his power to choose his attitude. Wow, the power to choose our attitudes. So when I'm having a bad day or I feel like Ugh, nothing is working right, I really honestly just have to think of that very simple and profound statement from Dr. Frankel and remember that we always have a choice. This is a, another favorite quote of mine from Henry Ford. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Our minds, as you well know, are very, very powerful. And we create a lot of our perceived realities. And if we truly believe that we can accomplish something, that will happen. And we know that the reverse side of that also happens. So it's very important that we be mindful and conscious of what we allow to come in to our beautiful minds. The sixth uh, component, the sixth factor of this pillar of love of self is presence. It's really showing up. You know, in this world of technology and this wonderful ability to be across the world, across the globe, and, and talking with each other and sharing and learning and expanding our minds is amazing. And we communicate 24-7. However, oftentimes when we're communicating, we're only really showing up physically in our body and our mind may be somewhere else or our spirit is not with us. And so it's important that we show up fully when we engage with other people. Uh, mind, body, and spirit presence. It's very, uh, I've heard often say, our presence is the best presence <laughs> that we can give to someone. Love this quote by Thich Nhat Hanh, the most precious gift that we can offer others is our presence. When mindfulness embraces those we love, they will bloom like flowers. And the final pillar in love of self is health and wellness. You know, we're smart people, we're educated, we're experienced, and we know how to eat properly, how to take care of ourselves, how to set a aside quiet time. Um, and yet sometimes we, we, we don't do that. <laughs> While the mind may know, the body may not be willing. Um, so it's important that we take care of this vessel um, that houses our, our most authentic self. And, um, and eat well. <laughs> let's put better food into our bodies than we're putting fuel into our cars. Uh, let's put our feet up when we're tired. Uh, are we getting eight hours of sleep at night? Uh, it's important that we take care of this physical body and our mind and our spirit as well. 
which takes us into the second of three pillars, which is love of source. Now, I've often been asked, why did I choose the term source? And really, it was to emphasize um, where we go to get our energy. Where do we go to refuel? Where do we go to feel that connection of something much greater than ourselves? And I also wanted to be very inclusive and mindful um, to not present this in a religious doctrine way, uh, because I didn't want to leave out people who maybe practiced a different religion or a different faith. So I really wanted to focus on where is that source of vitality? Where does that source of love come from? This is another favorite quote of mine from Patanjali. When you are inspired by some great purpose, some extraordinary project, all your thoughts break their bonds. Your consciousness expands in every direction and you find yourself in a new, great and wonderful world. Dormant forces, faculties and talents become alive and you discover yourself to be a greater person by far than you ever dreamed yourself to be. Love of source, the first factor of this pillar is absolutely inspiration. That's where we go to be inspired in spirit. The second factor is creativity. This is where we go, where we're energized and we're, and we're creative. This is that space where innovation and creativity occur. And of course, when we tap into that source that connection of something greater that's where we find such deep internal happiness it's where we find our faith our faith in ourselves and our faith in others it's where that grit that perseverance during those times and those seasons in our life when we feel that we just couldn't go a step further it's that connection to source that helps us persevere. And it is absolutely that place of peace. It is absolutely that place of love. It is absolutely our most authentic self. So how do we do it? Well, we do it through stillness. We do it through prayerfulness or meditation, through journaling. Um, and that path and that connection will look different for each one of us. I have a very, very good friend of mine, Michael, who is a practicing Buddhist. And he says, Maria, I cannot for the life of me meditate. I just can't do it. But what I do is I hike. And when I hear my footsteps on the dirt in that, that rhythmic pattern, I connect. I connect. That's my meditation. And I could relate to that because oftentimes when I'm swimming laps in my pool, it's that rhythmic sound of my water, my hands hitting that water. And I get into that place of full connection with source. So it will look different for those of us that are unique. And then, of course, another great way to tap into our source is through gratitude through gratitude. I remember several years ago reading an article uh, from Oprah Winfrey that was talking about a 21-day challenge in gratitude. And it was to have a gratitude journal. And each day for 21 days, we were to write down, I think it was five things for which we were grateful. Well, many days, many things would fly um, from my head and my heart through my hand and my pen onto the paper. And I would have at least five and oftentimes many, many more. And then there were other days where I really had to think about five things for which I was grateful. But the funny thing is not too long after I had started this practice, I realized that the things for which I was grateful actually started appearing more frequently and more. And there was this abundance of 
of people and things and, and joy that just kept coming into my life through this gratitude practice. Well, needless to say, I didn't stop. Uh, so, so have continued really being mindful of the gratitude uh, that I feel for different aspects of my life. We even actually in our, in our household, we now have a chalkboard in the hallway that we pass by many, many times throughout the day. And we have now called this our gratitude board. And uh, Dr. Church, are you here? This last time. Okay. Yeah, I think she's gone off air. We'll just wait till she comes back. <clears throat> and gratitude, gratitude is, again, like I said, very, very um, important in our family. So I believe I was telling you the story of my daughter, Melissa, is coming home for Christmas. And she hit this horrible rain slash mud storm. Well, in sorry, between... sorry, Dr. Maria, uh, yes. just to interrupt you, sorry, you got cut off before you even began this incident. So perhaps you could start from the start of the incident. We didn't hear that. We only heard oh, about I... gratitude and yes. how, you know, you have difficulty at times uh, finding five, but then you started seeing the things appear. That's where we lost you. So maybe you can begin with Melissa. Yeah. Yes. So Melissa, my daughter, um, I, I had shared my gratitude practice that became so important to me. Um, and one of the things that we did in our household is we uh, took a chalkboard and uh, we painted gratitudes on it. And that became um, our gratitude board in our family. And so we had it very predominantly placed in the hallway where we passed by every day. And um, we would just again, the whole family, or we've invited friends to, to um, write their gratitudes on the board when they felt so moved. So it, again, became a, a regular practice in our family. So Melissa, my daughter, was coming home at Christmas, as she, as she always did, and she lived about three hours away. Well, this particular drive, um, there was an incredible rainstorm that happened. And in the area between uh, Phoenix, where she lived, and um, and Cochise County, where we were located in the canyons of the mountains there, um, there was a lot of open desert. And there was one particular place where it was very flat. And um, when it got, got really windy, we would see a lot of the dust devils that would happen there. Well, with this incredible storm, the wind was happening and the, and the wind from the desert and the rain created a, a rainstorm of mud. And she could barely see out of the window. Well, this was um, before GPS was, was showing up in a lot of vehicles. And so my husband was on the cell phone with her, sort of being her GPS and helping to guide her where she could you know, get off of the interstate because there were accidents happening all over. Needless to say, people couldn't see out of their win windows. And so she... Um, she, her trip that normally would take three hours was five and a half hours to get home for Christmas. Well, of course, we were right at the door to greet her as soon as she got home. And, and, and before she even hugged us, before she even stopped into the restroom after a five and a half hour trip, she dropped her bags in the hallway, ran to the gratitude board, and wrote on there how grateful she was to be home safely. <laughs> the gratitudes and remembering the gratitudes and being mindful of the gratitudes became such an important part of our family. So let us move to the last third and final pillar, which is love of others. So if we think about really first focusing on ourself and, and really uh, centering ourself and then connecting with source, then the next automatic extension is outward. And that's others, love of others. The first of seven factors that we see under this pillar is forgiveness. 
you know, the funny thing about forgiveness is not only is it helpful and useful and a path to reconnect with others, but forgiveness is so profound for ourselves as individuals. I remember a time when I worked um, for the home builder and my mentor would come in once a month and we would meet. Well, like many mentor relationships, he became a confidant of mine. And I shared with him some of the difficulties that I was having with my boss at the time. I remember at one point he went and he had lunch with my boss and he came back and he was different and he was very distant. And my boss later that day had called me into the office and had made some major shifts and changes in my job and my responsibility. And had actually removed a lot of responsibility and a lot of authority um, out, out of my role. And he had shared with me what my mentor had shared with him. And I was so hurt that my mentor had betrayed my confidences. And I was mad. And I did what a lot of good mad women do. I gave him the silent treatment. <laughs> I didn't talk to him for two years. I'm a tenacious, persistent woman. And I remember during that two years, um, really reaching out to a colleague who was a counselor. And I needed some help because I was being torn up inside. The stress level was off the charts. Uh, I was starting on blood pressure medicine and I was just under 40. Um, and I, I was having a lot of stomach issues and you know, the kind of things that our body tells us when there's an imbalance and an inharmony happening within us. Well, I got to the point, and I'm so grateful to uh, my counselor friend who helped me. I got to the point where I realized I needed to forgive him. Not only to start to repair our relationship, but I needed to forgive him for myself as well. And so the next month that he came into the office, I invited him back into my private office. And I said to him, I realize that I have been extremely unprofessional with you and quite ugly in my behavior with you. And I apologize. Oh my gosh. I was so glad I was standing next to my desk because I literally had to reach over to my desk and grab hold because I felt like I was going to float away. I felt 50 pounds lighter. It was the best diet I have ever been on because I felt so light and I felt so free. Now I'm a smart woman and I was raised under the Catholic faith. So I learned how to ask forgiveness when I went to confession from a very, very young age um, on a regular basis. But I have to admit, and I'm embarrassed to admit, but I have to admit that really for the first time in my life at almost the age of 40, I realized what forgiveness really meant. Better late than never. The other component, the other factor to, uh, to look at under love of others is the ability to create knowledge. I wholeheartedly believe that fear is the number one killer of knowledge. And there have been extensive studies done, a lot of research done by two Japanese researchers, Nonaka and Mishigishi. And they wanted to study and understand how organizations, some organizations versus other organizations are innovative. Why is it that just some are? And so in their studies, as they're peeling back the layers and really trying to understand, they realize that there's an energy, for lack of a better word, that is in the, in the creative and innovative organizations. It was a certain energy that was there. And they call that energy BA, B-A. Well now, okay, that's exciting. So how do we get BA to come on over to our organization for a while and infuse some innovation over here? And so then again, they wanted to study those particular organizations where BA existed. And again, they were peeling back the layers and they determined that in each one of those organizations where Ba existed, 
that there were four organizational culture factors present in every one of these organizations. And those four factors are love, care, trust, and connection. Love, care, trust, and connection had to be present for innovation to occur. Learning cultures is the third of seven of these factors under love of others. The learning culture where we create an environment where we're in constant growth, we're in constant learning, we're in constant development because the reality is there is no static. If we're not learning and we're not growing, we're going backwards and sometimes quite rapidly. So when we practice love-based leadership and we focus on love of others, we create these vibrant, energized cultures of learning and growth and development. Also shared ownership and shared power are four and five of the seven under love of others. This is a, a photograph of some uh, factory workers in Mexico. And this particular um, company, food manufacturing company, um, had a safety contest because they wanted to up the safety in their factories. So they had a competition going between the American factory and the Mexican factory. And what they did is they won. <laughs> The Mexican factory won, hands down. They went over, it was 120 days without a single cut on a finger. In a factory, over 120 days without a single cut on a finger. Slammed it. How did they do it? Well, this is how they did it. They invited their family and their friends into the factory before the competition began. And they had lots of different colors of paint all around the factory. And what they did is they invited their loved ones, their families and their friends to dip their hands into the different colors of paint. And then they invited them to put their handprints all over the factory walls, all over the factory walls. So every single day when the factory workers came into the plant to work, they were literally and figuratively surrounded by love. They won because they were focused on love, not on the fear of losing. The sixth element of love of others is collaboration. We have found time and time again in our own research that organizations that practice love, love-based leadership leading with love have an increase in collaboration. Well, we all know what happens when we have an increase in collaboration in our organizations. We are communicating better. We are innovating. We are productive. We are motivated. We are attached to the meaningfulness of work. This takes me to my daughter, Melissa. Let me introduce you to Melissa. Now, this is a picture of her many years ago, uh, but these are two of my favorite images of my daughter, Melissa. The first one that we see over on the left-hand side, she is sitting under a hairdryer. Um, this was, I think, getting ready for one of my sister's weddings, and she's sitting on several phone books and photo albums because her little tiny body was too small to have the benefits of the hairdryer. Um, and she looks quite bored, um, but she just looks so darn adorable. It is one of my favorite photos. And then the other one is after a shower and, and she has her hair wrapped up in a towel and her smile just makes my heart melt. Well, I share Melissa with you today because she taught me a very important lesson about finding meaning in the work that we do. Um, almost seven years ago, it will be seven years in November, I uh, had a mastectomy. I had been diagnosed with breast cancer and had a mastectomy. I'm fine and healthy and vibrant today. And, um, and the surgery was the cure. Well, after a mastectomy, um, needless to say with any surgery, um, you're very sore, you're very tender, 
Um, and with this particular type of surgery, uh, it was very limited in my mobility with my, with my arms. I wasn't able to lift my arms up. And um, for several days after the surgery, I wasn't able to uh, shower uh, myself, hair tubes and all kind of crazy stuff um, as a result of the surgery. And I remember uh, this particular evening uh, before bedtime, my daughter was helping me in the shower and I, she was drying me off. And I remember looking down at her and just saying, <laughs> you know, honey, never in my wildest dreams did I envision this scenario. And she just looked up at me with that smile and she just smiled and she continued to dry me off. A few minutes later, uh, she was helping me get into my nightgown and get into bed. And she had pulled the covers up, layered the drains and, and whatnot, and got me settled, pulled the covers up. And then she leaned over and she kissed me on the forehead. And she said, mom, it's my honor. You know, I realized in that moment that Melissa taught me how important service is and equal is the important allowing people to serve. In that experience for Melissa, she was able, able to tap into a very profound realization of the meaningfulness of purpose, of doing a work, of doing a job. Yeah. Sometimes our children teach us lessons, but let's just keep that on the down. <laughs> let's keep that one on the down low. You know, as leaders, we are bridge builders. We build bridges uh, from perhaps senior leadership to frontline leadership, uh, to frontline staff. Uh, we build um, communication from one aspect of the organization to another. But even more importantly, as leaders, we are bridge builders for others to find that meaning, to find their meaningfulness in the work that they do. We as love-based leaders find that meaning and we tap into that. And again, leadership is a responsibility. And so we can help people tap into the meaningfulness in the work that they do, in their own work and their contribution to the organization. You know, when I Dr. talk Church, about... Yes. Church, sorry to interrupt. I just wanted yes. to give you a quick alarm, uh, a be your, be your clock alarm. Uh, there, you have about uh, nine, 10 minutes more of the time. Uh, yes. So please use it as you want. Just wanted to remind you. Thank you. This is the last bit of information that I was going to share with you. And I thought we'd open it up for about five minutes for questions. So thank you so much for the alarm. I appreciate that. I too was watching. Uh, this is um, former president uh, Manuel Santos from Colombia, South America, and his wonderful wife, Maria. Love the name. Um, anyway, I had the pleasure of meeting them on uh, Sir Richard Branson's island, Necker Island. And um, I was really struck by, I've always known the power of love, but struck by a story that President Santos shared with us about how he helped the country end their 60 year war with the FARC. And he did it with love. In fact, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for his work. So how did he end a war multiple generations with love? Well. What they did is there was this last group of gorillas that were holding out deep in the jungle of South America. And he invited the nation, <laughs> the families and friends of these gorillas to write notes, love letters call it. And he put these notes and other trinkets. You can see a stuffed animal here. There might've been little pieces of jewelry, but he had them personalized for the individual people. And these notes were basically requests from their family and their loved ones to end the war. It was right before Christmas. And some of the notes said, you know, daddy, please come home. It's Christmas time. Or please put down your arms and put your arms around me. Son, please 
end the war, come home. And the military then dropped these spheres into the river so that they would float deep into the jungle. Well, they were also powered by solar. And so at night they lit up. And as they went deep into the jungle and this gorilla group opened these spheres and started reading them, they put down their arms <laughs> and the war ended after 60 years of war. And it ended because of love. I mentioned earlier that this is a time for our wake-up call. And I love this Chinese proverb. When sleeping women wake, mountains move. And I invite all of you, men and women alike, let's listen to that wake-up call. Let's go ahead and move some mountains today. Thank you very much. Let's open up for questions. Uh, so let's uh, uh, get out of the uh, uh, screen share mode and anyone please raise your hand, put a hand icon up or uh, type in the chat and, and you know, we'll take as many comments or questions as we can. Look at all these beautiful people. <laughs> Okay, so there's a question, uh, Dr. Maria from Harish, saying, uh, thank you, Dr. Maria, for painting the love leadership matrix here. Could you share what experiences led you to formulating the matrix? Yes, absolutely. I had been in senior leadership, as I mentioned earlier, for this Fortune 500 company. And I felt like when I went into the workplace, that I had to check my soul at the door, that I had to check my spirit at the door, and that I really had to compartmentalize myself. And that really never felt authentic to me. I really believed that I was most powerful when I brought my whole self to work, mind, body, and spirit. And so when I began my doctoral studies, I started to formulate this model of leading with love. And and, you know, when we have advanced degrees and we do advanced studies, we take a deep dive into that topic area, as I did then into leadership. And I, I saw a plethora of leadership models, and I really was hard pressed to find any leadership models that were holistic in nature. And so I think my professional experience, as well as my academic studies, um, really called me to to develop this, this holistic leadership model of love-based leadership. Okay, Ramesh, please go ahead. Ramesh, are you Can't not audible? You, Ramesh. Oh, Hello. Yeah, now you're audible, so please go okay. ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, Maria, Thank you very much. I'm very stunned by what you have shared on one hand, and I'm very touched by on the other. Uh, and to tell you the truth, this is all absolutely common sense. What you have shared is absolute common sense. But the way you have garlanded it in those books, words, that's what makes greater sense. Many years ago, around uh, 35 years ago, uh, when I was the regional coordinator of Delhi ISABs, I had invited Professor Rolf Linton for a meeting for the Delhi region. And he asked me, what do you want to talk? What, what do you want me to talk about? I said, uh, anything that you would, uh, 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 you know, deem uh, okay for a professional and semi-professional group. And the talk that he, uh, his talk was uh, nomenclature, the sound of sense. And, and it was a beautiful talk. 
it was just as sensible so i was reminded by your talk of that sound of sense thank you very much thank Grateful. you so much and i appreciate um the way you framed that and how you stated it that it really is common sense and it's funny because i know world today and many of our cultures really give value to things that are complex so it's almost like it has to be complex to to have value and i don't ascribe to that belief i think that simple is profound and i think that with the complexity of the world today that we sometimes forget the sensibility yeah. of a message as simple as love so i appreciate that thank you so much salutations to you uh dr church there are a lot of comments coming in which talk about how compassionate how inspiring and how touching your presentation is there are a few questions too so i'm going to take them in the order that they've come and we'll stop when the when the time is up and the next question that had come is from prabhakar which says have you used this approach in any conflict resolution scenario I'm sorry you cut out there could you would you refresh re, uh restate the that please The question yeah the question is have you used this approach in any conflict <laughs> resolution scenario have oh you used goodness. your approach in any conflict resolution say the situation yeah. Yes absolutely and um really uh oftentimes in conflict it's because there was a breakdown in understanding um and so that's really again i had mentioned really at the at the top of the presentation how important uh, perception shifting is and so many times in conflict in fact i'm working with a mayor and council right now in a town uh, because they they cannot even be in the same room together without conflict and so really what we're doing is we're looking at how powerful the ability to shift our perceptions are and so we're talking about the fact that we see the world this way and we understand that we see the world this way but that it's also important and very helpful if we can see the world this way or we can see the world this way or what's even better is if we can see the world this way because then we open up it, as i had stated earlier possibilities and when we are in conflict we don't see possibilities and so talking through and working through um perception shifting and then also recognizing the choice that we have in the situation sometimes in conflict we back ourselves into a position we back ourselves into a corner and sometimes we don't see the path to get out and back on the path of collaboration and cooperation so absolutely taking concepts from this model and making it very applicable i have done that many many times okay uh it's 8:32 sushma i want to check with you uh do we have the extra 2 3 minutes for the connection loss or do you want me to stop now i'm i'm fine to answer some more questions if if you were asking me okay i was checking with the organizers with sushma yeah. and anu anuradha ji i think sushma may not be as a uh, screen yeah i i was saying that we need to stop because we have the next session okay so Thank then you. dr church i uh, i invite you to read the chat because there are a lot of lovely messages and you know uh, thanks but there's also questions in there one or two so i uh, want to point with that i want to uh, thank everyone and thank dr church for being here uh, yes it was simple and profound but the simple is always the most difficult to do but at least you've given very concrete paths you know they were very concrete they were very relatable uh elements that you've highlighted so thank you for that